All right, so after nine years of traveling around the world, coaching people just like you on how to communicate the value of what you do, why you do it, and why anyone should care, I know one very important thing. Most of you cannot tell people what you do in one powerful, memorable sentence. You probably need two or three or maybe a half an hour before they actually get it. And I'm here to suggest to you that if you can't put it in one sentence, you may never get to the second sentence. Because they say, oh, you make a social media networking platform for golfers? Oh, huh. okay. Oh, you do big data analytics with 3D dashboards? Well, so what? The investors you're talking to have heard those things over and over and over again. And if you're not doing things to stand out, to be more memorable, then you'll get lost in the noise. Do you want to get lost in the noise? I don't think so, because if you came to this talk, you probably are looking for ways to rise above that noise. And I am here to give you some of those tools. This is a practical talk. I'm going to talk for maybe 20-ish minutes, and then we're going to use the rest of the hour to try it out. This is a lunch and learn and work. You got a free lunch? I'm gonna make you pay for it now. All right? Here we go. Unfortunately, most of you cannot stand up in front of a group of investors like you and say, ladies and gentlemen, we have discovered the cure for every cancer known to mankind. Do you wanna know more? I mean, if you knew anybody that was involved with cancer, you'd wanna know more. You would, but most of you can't say that. So we need other ways for you to communicate what you do. Now, if you have something that powerful, that literal, go ahead and just say it. You don't have to beat around the bush as some of you are doing, okay? Because you don't want to exactly tell somebody what you're doing because it sounds like what Dropbox is doing or it sounds like what Trello is doing or it sounds like something else somebody else is doing. So let's begin by taking you back to 1963. True story. President John F. Kennedy was touring NASA in Cape Canaveral, and he stopped the tour and he walked over to a man standing on the side of the building and he asked the man, what do you do here at NASA? And the man looked up at the president and he said, Mr. President, I'm helping to put a man on the moon. Now here's how most entrepreneurs try to answer a question like that when an investor asks you, what do you do? What does your company do? They say, oh, uh, Mr. President, I'm the head janitor here. I've been here for 22 years, haven't had a sick day in all that time. We have 18 vehicles in our system and we have blah, 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 until the person falls asleep with their eyes open. <laughs> I don't want you to end up in that situation, all of you whether you just have an idea in mind, or whether you have a product that people are actually giving you money to use, or a service, you need to be able to tell people what you do with a powerful sentence, something like, we're helping to put a man on the moon. Metaphorically, all of you are doing that. You just have to figure out what is that statement. We need to elevate, we need to abstract a few hundred thousand feet or kilometers up then look down and see what you're doing. And now I want to give you the tools to help you get to that one line. Ready? Here we go. Any questions? All right. I'm going to give you what some people call the red box method now. Uh, I promised myself when I started this business I wasn't going to come up with yet another methodology for people to use, but I needed uh, a metaphor. So I bought a, I mean, I mean a, needed a picture to illustrate my metaphor of a toolbox. So right now I'm going to give you five tools that you can use to come up with this one sentence that describes to people what you do so that they do this rather than this. Which do you want people to do, lean in or lean out? Lean in. 
so the only reason my clients call it the red box method is because I chose this picture, high resolution picture of a red box. So whatever, call it what you will. But this is a formula more than anything to help you remember five tools. I'm only going to give you five of the nine tools that are in here today because we only have a few short minutes to work together. The others are not that important to the one sentence anyway. Here we go. In the land of startup world and ecosystem of telling people what you're doing, what does this stand for? VP stands for not, not a person, it stands for what? Come on. Value, proposition. value proposition, thank you. Now your value proposition is one of the most important things you need to iron out in your businesses. The problem that most of you th that have in your brains is you think that you only need one. Truth is you might need three. You might need one for an investor who you want to impart your value in one way, yet to a customer you might want to tweak that sentence a little bit so that you're not using terms that are applied to an investor but more to a customer. And then you might need a third value proposition when you meet somebody out on the veranda over here of a lunch and they say, so what do you guys do? You don't know if they're a customer, you don't know if they're an investor, but you still have to answer the question. You can't say we're in stealth mode, can't tell you. Anybody that tells you that, in fact, you'll never find anybody in this building that will tell you that because they don't allow people in here that do that. It's not a way to run your business. At least I think that you don't allow anybody in here that does that. So the truth is we're always communicating our value to people and we call it this value proposition thing because we need a label on it so we can identify something within the lean startup and also an investor will come up to you and say, so what's your value prop? If you don't have a good answer, you're dead. Forget it, you're done. They're gonna look for the next person they wanna to talk to. The problem with value propositions are they're too complicated. And the long ones take too long to get through. So, do you know the name Steve Blank? Many of you probably know this name. He's the grandfather of the lean startup. Eric Ries was his student, yeah. So he got sick and tired of people going blah, 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 and then he'd say, what do you do? I still don't get, and they go blah, 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 blah. I still don't know what you do. So he came up with a new value proposition format that I've been using now with my clients for about seven years. It's a beautiful way to take whatever value proposition or propositions that you have and boil it down into one sentence. Here it is. We help X do Y by doing Z. You fill in the X with who you help, you fill in the Y with what you do, you fill in the Z with how you do it, and now you have your value proposition or a value proposition that you can use with a designated audience. Okay. Now, if I asked all of you in the room right now to come up with a value proposition based on this format, I want you all to break the rules. I don't want 80 of you, which it looks like we have in the room here, to come back and say, we help, we help, we help, we help. We, that's ridiculous. Some of you reduce, some of you improve, some of you decrease. Right, use the word that applies to your business. And the one thing that Steve doesn't talk about here that I've heard investors complain a lot about is before you actually tell me this in front of this, what is it? Is it a mobile app? Is it a platform? Is it hardware? Is it an IoT device? Is it a pill? But what is it? So we make a mobile app that helps people, blah, 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 blah. Okay? So you don't have to put that, we make a mobile app in the front, but investors like to know that. They wanna put you in a bucket. Are you software, are you hardware, are you services? You know, what are you? Okay? What's the one part of this you can leave off? You can leave off who you help, right? That's not that important. You can leave off how you do it, because if you do a good job in telling people what you do, they might just say what? Look, you're smiling. What would they say? How do you do it? And now you have a dialogue going. There's nothing more effective with anyone, not just investors, to get out of the monologue into a dialogue as quickly as possible. And the way to do that is to say one thing, get them to react, and then go on to the next thing. And that way, your elevator pitching doesn't become you just going blah, 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 until they fall asleep. Here is the first half of my value proposition. If you ask me what I do, I would tell people I help 
I help people prepare for high stakes presentations. Full stop. If you don't ask me how, you're not interested. So I don't need to tell you how, but if I was in a room with a bunch of, if all of you were pitch coaches and, and uh, mentors like that, and somebody said, Nathan, what do you do? I would say, I help people prepare for high stakes presentations by rehearsing them as if they were performing in a Broadway show. And I see some smiles on the faces in the room because I know what you're feeling right now because when you think of going to a Broadway show, you say, oh boy, I'd like to perform like they perform and that's exactly how I want you to feel when you hear me say this. Most people say things and they don't realize that people are going to feel something or they don't even think, what should I say so people feel something? They just say something in hopes that people feel something. But you can get people to respond and I'm gonna give you the tricks to it, to doing it right now. So you can see what I did in my sentence. As you travel around the internet, and you look at marketing materials, and you listen to the news, and you read newspapers and whatnot, when you see somebody else's value proposition, and you like it, or it's intriguing, or it's interesting, or it's memorable, write it down, copy it, paste it into a file in your cloud somewhere, and start collecting them. Because when you need to go sit down and come up with one of your own, it's a whole lot easier at looking at about 150 other people's than it is to try to scratch your head and say, oh God, no, we needed a value proposition. How do we, I need examples. So the more examples you have, the easier it will be for you to come up with your own. My file that I've been collecting over nine years now, it must have 1,200 value propositions in it. People have been asking me to publish it, but not sure if I wanna do that quite yet. So look at this value proposition. If I was bid sketch, and by the way, your value propositions aren't just something you answer to an investor when they say, what's your value prop? They go in the headlines of the brochures that plug and play hands out at the expos too. That one line when people sit down and they start reading through, okay, who are the 60 companies I'm gonna see today? And they start reading through those lines. Are they gonna read a line that says, we help put a man on the moon? I don't see too many of those. And some of you are probably saying, well, it's too gimmicky for me. Well, you know what? I'm just about helping you rise above the noise and get people curious about what you're doing. If it's too gimmicky for you, you can go ahead and be literal. But if you're literal and people don't respond, then we need to work on something else. So if I said to you, we create professional client proposals in minutes, you might want to know more. If somebody at a networking event or at lunch or I fall on their website, all of this information is above the fold. If I, want to, if I need professional client proposals, I'm gonna go below the fold to find out. Now there's two words in this value proposition that make it stand out among all the other companies that do professional client proposals. What are those two words? In minutes. In minutes. <laughs> if any other company does professional client proposals in minutes, they have to say, we do too. We do it in minutes also. Or they have to say, we do it in seconds, right? It's the Geico commercial, you know, 15 minutes, we'll reduce it by 15%. Now you're seeing other insurance companies coming out and saying, we can do reduce it in 10 minutes. So they start battling on things like that. So what I'm just trying to point out is, Sometimes your value proposition doesn't need any fancy words in it. It just needs another word or two to up-level the impact of what does it mean when I say, we create professional client proposals. <clears throat> well, so what? We do it in minutes. Ah, I wanna know more about that, okay? This you've never heard before. I know this for a fact, and all of you out there in video land, I know you've never heard this before because I made it up myself. The only problem is there's no app to download, so I can't monetize it. <laughs> anyway, this tool will help you figure out all the value that you provide as a company with your product and your service. It's called the value proposition matrix. All it is is a spreadsheet. Okay, you all know how to do a spreadsheet, right? So your X labels in your spreadsheet are who get value, who gets value from your product or your service, okay? And you might need one of these for each product or each service. You might not be able to condense everything onto one spreadsheet. Along the column labels, you list all the values that you supply. What is an example of a value that you, that you provide? 
we cut costs, we increase revenues, we save time. You know, all the things that people are buying your product or service for. They're not buying your product to have a product. It's the old, I don't buy a drill to have a drill. Right? Although some of you might, you might. You might buy a drill because you want to buy a drill. But the rest of us, we buy a drill because we need a hole. Right? Okay. So list all the values. And then inside each of the cells, you list how you provide this value for that who. And you do it over and over and over until the whole spreadsheet's filled in. If you have more than one way that you provide value for that who, then write them all in. And by the time you're done with this, you will look back and say, wow, look at all the value we have. Because what most of you get stuck in is you pick one or two values for one or two who's and then you leave all the rest of it off. When in fact you have so much to offer. And over the years I've had people tell me that they actually bring this chart out with investors. They thin it out a little bit, but it's an easy way to convey all the value in one picture and they actually are using it with their clients as well. I don't know exactly how they're doing it with their clients, but um, I'm a little bit, uh, a tiny bit OCD, like 0.0001% OCD. Like this is not done to me. But you might never have anything to put in these blocks, why? Why not? Anybody want to take a guess? You might not have anything ever in here because you don't provide that value for that who. It just doesn't. It doesn't make sense. So for me, I would cross them out. And then I know, okay, I'm done. <sighs> Otherwise, every time I would look at this, I get stressed out. Sorry. Maybe you wouldn't. Okay, so that's tool number one. I have four more to give you, all at the same time. They're very easy. In fact, these are so simple, you already know what they are. But once I remind you of what they are, you'll see how powerful they can be when you need to boil down to one sentence what you do in a way that compels people to ask for more information, to get them curious, to get them intrigued, okay? So it starts with the value proposition, but then we can drop that off if we want and use one of these, or you can use the value proposition in conjunction with one of these. Any questions? Here we go. The first one. How many of you have been on this airplane where you get to feel microgravity or zero gravity? You know, where you get to do this, or this, or this? It's only about $10,000 for a ticket. Anybody want to go? Oh, first of all, anybody been up there in the room here? Nobody? Anybody want to go? All right, for those of you who have your hands up, you can put your hands down for a second. I'm just curious. If I had to ask you right now, what do you think it feels like for this person and all these people that are literally weightless without being in space? They're weightless. What do you think they feel in their bodies? What do you think it feels like? Not a feeling in the head, but a, feeling, a physical feeling that we've all had on Earth. What do you think it feels like? I guess. Water. water, being in water, scuba diving, floating. Anybody here not been in water? You probably don't want to raise your hand. I shouldn't ask that question. Uh, <laughs> sorry, don't raise your hand. But that's exactly what it feels like. And I've talked to three people now who've been up there and they say, yeah, it feels like that. It also feels like when you go over a bump in a road that you don't know that it's there and your stomach goes, whoa, that sort of feels like that on roller coasters and things like that. So now that you know what it feels like, you can tell everybody you know what it feels like to be weightless in space or weightless in this airplane, and now you can save your $10,000. Because all we did was boil it down to a simile. And that is the power of a simile. Weightlessness, microgravity, is very much like floating in a pool. Everybody in the room knows what that means, right? Now, I could go ahead and give you the scientific explanation. Would you like that? You would? Another time. Because we don't have time. Besides, half the words I would have to use, I wouldn't even know how to pronounce. And that's what most of you try to do, and all of you. You try to scientifically explain what the heck you're doing, and you know what? No one really cares. Especially in the beginning, where you're trying to get people interested. You know when they care? They care when you get into due diligence. You know when that happens? Meeting 
seven, eight, nine, fourteen, three years later. But in the beginning, you just want to give people reasons to not only remember you for what you do, but remember everybody you touch, they have networks too, don't they? And they need to be able to tell other people what you do if they want to share what you do with other people. So it's not just about you getting yourself straight, it's about you getting yourself straight so that other people can be straight too. Tool number three. Oops. We have to join back. Tool number three is A. And I'll just play this so you can watch it while I talk about it. Whoop, that's a little bit loud. Okay, so I asked the CEO many years ago, what do you do? And he said, Nathan, I'm the CEO of Maverick Surfboards. We do for surfing what the chairlift does for downhill snow skiers. He stopped. He said, you know, the problem with surfing is 95% of surfing is this. Well, we built an electric surfboard that you have a little wireless controller that goes on your thumb. You press the button and it engages the motor to let you get out to the wave you want to surf or ahead of the wave you want to surf, and now you can have a whole lot more fun surfing instead of using your arms. You might think that's crazy, but not if you're a surfer. So when he said, we do for surfing what the chairlift does for downhill snow skiing, he was using an analogy. Now the thing is, you already know these things, but you forget that an simile and analogy are very powerful tools to bring out again in your businesses. A simile is all you need in most cases. You know what? Many of you probably have some very complex stuff to talk about, don't you? Some of you have probably have PhDs and you've been doing what you're doing for so long, but yet you meet an investor who may not have any clue about what you do and you try to scientifically explain to them what you do. It isn't going to work, folks. You must go to things like similes and analogies or you're going to lose your audiences. We could have, he could have said we make electric surfboards. Are you excited to know more? Mm, maybe. And now for the third, and uh, well, the, uh, sorry, the fourth tool, which is M. This is my favorite because it is one of the most powerful. About five years ago, a guy jumps up on stage, he has seven minutes to present, and he says, ladies and gentlemen, I'm thrilled to be here to share with you our machines that we build that turn water into money. And that's how the whole audience reacted. They smiled, they chuckled, they even laughed. Because wouldn't you want to see a machine that was built that turns water into money? Wouldn't you get a little curious about something like that? Of course you would. So right up on the screen, he puts this video. And right in front of everybody, he says, this is a machine about one meter, about a yard long. And you throw it into a rushing waterway, you tie it off to the side, you plug it in, and as the water starts flipping the flappers in the middle, it starts generating free electricity with those micro turbines under those yellow housings. So does he build a machine that turns water? Yes. Into money? Some of you are going, yeah. No, I don't think so. But metaphorically, he is. And that's what the, meta the M stands for. Using a metaphor can be the one most powerful thing that you can say to anyone. Four or five years later, I still run into people who were at that presentation in San Francisco, and I always love to say, what's the one presentation, or what presentation do you remember from that day? And without hesitation, they say, oh, the guy that builds a machine that turns water into money. Now, building a machine that turns water into money has nothing to do with canal turbines, does it? But if he stood up there and said, ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to show you our canal turbines. <laughs> Go to sleep. Go back to doing your emails, because I don't need one of those. And what the heck is a canal turbine anyway? But if you want to buy one of these things, you have to Google canal turbines, right? You can't Google a machine that turns water into money. Although by now, because I've been telling this story so long, Google Maybe we'll pick up on that. Maybe Twitter, who cares? And tool number five to wrap this up is E. Sometimes when we tell people what we do, they still, we need to give them something else. Does anybody want to take a guess as to what the E stands for? 
Thank you. Examples. We need to give people examples, right? But the problem is, how do you give people an example in one sentence? Well, that's really easy. You're not giving them the detail of the example. All you're saying is that we da 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 da. For example, when you're riding your bike or driving in a car. And now you know that whatever I just told you is being used when riding a bike or driving a car. And if you do either of those things, you might want to know more. Okay? So that's all you need to do with examples. And that's where you can have an example combined together with a simile or an analogy or a metaphor all in the same sentences. Okay? And this makes for a very powerful, powerful way to leave a lasting impression on anyone that you're talking to. Two warnings come with using similes, analogies, and metaphors. Big warnings. One is they can potentially be culturally sensitive. Okay, so here's how it works. If uh, Connie, you and I, we just had a discussion and I said to you, Connie, you know what, that's like chalk and cheese. Who here knows what that means? That's like chalk and cheese. Does anybody here know what that means? Look, we're in a room full of 80 people here. No one knows what that means? That's what I mean. They're culturally sensitive. This is an Irish saying. It's kind of like oil and water, they don't mix. But it's also got a second meaning, which is from here, the chalk is white and cheese is white. I can't tell the difference. I'm going to have to get a little closer. I'm going to have to touch and feel. I'm going to have to spend a little more time with them before I can give you my answer kind of thing. So if I said to you, that's like chalk and cheese in Ireland, they'll know they were just comparing two things together and you need more time. But in America, in Chile, in Singapore, in Bangalore, you say something like this, people are going to go, what? what? What did they just say? So the way to avoid this is just to give us the other half. So if you don't know if people understand your use of that simile, analogy, or metaphor, just include the other piece of it, right? Just say, oh, Connie, that's like chalk and cheese. Uh, let me come take a look uh, after I'm done here, and I'll give you my answer, because I, I need to touch them. And then you would know, oh, chalk is white, cheese is white, chalk is yellow, cheese is yellow. I get that. I can kind of get it from that. Okay. So those are the five tools that you can use to construct a new value proposition format for multiple value propositions. And then you have similes, analogies, metaphors, and examples to up-level what you tell people in the first breath when they say, what does your company do? Now, there is one exception to this. One exception to coming off with just your answer. When somebody says, what does your company do? Sometimes you can't just answer that question without asking them a question first. Okay, but you have to be careful about that. All right, we all really, like 99% of us, 99.9% .9 of us, should be able to answer the question, what do you do, without asking somebody a question first. You can tell if they're male or female, generally, and you can answer the question. Okay, but let me give you an example of where you might have to ask a question first. I ran into a client of a few years ago, and he said, Nathan, I don't even tell people what I do anymore because I'm just sick and tired of it. I said, what do you mean? He says, well, you see, what we do is uh, we can take a photo of the Earth about 1,500 feet up with a drone, 1,500 feet up, and then we run it through our quantum mechanics platform, and we can give a report of all of the minerals in the Earth within about a foot from the top, about a foot into the Earth. All the minerals, gold, silver, copper, whatever is in there, we can identify it. What's your next question? How do you do that? And he said, every time I would be asked that question, I would have to think, well, gee, <laughs> it's based on quantum mechanics. I've got a PhD. I've been doing it for 20 years. How do I boil it down in one sentence? I said, you don't. You ask him a question. You say, I'm just curious. And uh, be honest with me. How well versed? Now, uh, let me back up. So here's how I suggested he handle it. Somebody just asked him, well, what do you, how do you do that? And you say, I'm just curious, how well versed are you in quantum mechanics? You know nothing, okay. So if you don't know much about quantum mechanics, then I'm gonna be choosing a good simile, analogy, or metaphor. 
Because that's the only way you're going to understand it in one sentence. The only way you will understand it in one sentence. Did I say it would be the only way? No amount of time on earth will get somebody to understand the quantum mechanics, the, all of that detail, without a lot of education. Even Stephen Hawking's. You all know Stephen Hawking's, right, Professor Hawking's? You listen to some of his talks. Dial him up tonight and listen to how he talks. You'll probably hear a simile, an analogy, or a metaphor three or four times in every talk, and he'll keep going back to them. It's the only way we could understand. What's a black hole? I could draw a black hole. Yeah, just So similes, analogies, and metaphors are truly going to come into place for you if you realize how powerful they can be when you have something that's complex or something that's confusing. If you find people get confused when you're telling them what you do at any point in your pitch, that is the exact moment you need a good simile, analogy, or metaphor. We do it with our kids. Our parents did it with all of us as we were growing up, and you need to do it with adults again. So with that, I want to stop and say thank you very much for listening to me. I'd love to take any questions that you might have right now. You can find me at nathangold.com. Thank you. Thank you. So we have uh, 20 minutes. Uh, you are obviously free to go, unless Connie, you want to make them wait and earn the lunch. But what I'd like to offer you now for the last 20 minutes is if any of you want to come on up here and tell the audience what you do, trying maybe something new based on what you just heard here, you're welcome to do it now. You could come up here and tell us what you've been telling people you do, which is probably a little bit boring. <laughs> or a little confusing, and we can all work on it together for a couple of minutes here and see how this all works. Or the third option is, if you want to get a little sun, you can just contact me at nathangold.com and I'll help you, because I'm a friend of plug and play, no charge. Come Are you on, overwhelmed? we need one person. Yes. Okay, Hi. Hi. What's your name? Adela. Adela? Yes. Okay. Is she in the camera? Yeah. Okay, so Adela, are you going to try something new or are you going to try to tell us something that you've been telling people? I will try something new. Please feel free. <laughs> so we help people make and launch their iPhone apps in two months. How's okay. That? Okay. We Say it one more time. We help? We help people who doesn't understand coding to make and launch their app in App Store in two months. Okay, what did she add to the second one? <laughs> if you don't understand coding. You, missed, you left that out of the first one. Yeah. So the first one was a so what to me. It was like, oh, well, okay, so what? Yeah. But when you told me how, that little bit of the how in there, mm -hmm. that, or the, that part of it added much more depth for me. What about you in the room? The second one worked much better, didn't it? Do you want to say it one more time just so you have it in memory or you have it? I have it. Well done. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. It, it's not really, it's really that easy. So uh, who's next? Come on. Good to see you. Good to see you. All right. Stuff turns clutter into cash without you doing the work. Stuff is the name of the company. Stuff is a mobile app that turns clutter into cash without you doing the work. Okay. See the smiles on their faces? The <laughs> nods in their heads? That was the second one yeah. was better than the first one. And I would keep that one and keep telling people that one. So how many of you want to know more about that? That generated some curiosity, right? Because we all have clutter, right? Yes. We all want to make money. <laughs> we all want to turn that clutter into something rather than just putting it on the street unless you want to donate it. Well done. Thank you. All right. So, see, it's not that hard. What's really hard is coming up with the right words. And it does take some testing and validating with people in your team as well as people that you know. I call them friends. The people you want to test these out on before you go test them out on like Saeed <laughs> and Ali Reza and the other people in this building is you want to go out and test them on your I call them F cubed friends family followers and really friendly funders you know the the people who 
They probably won't invest in you, but they're friendly. We all need those kind of people in our lives. That's why you should always make friends with investors. Always make friends with investors. Even if you know they will never invest in you, they're, they're, they're in enterprise software, just make friends with them because if they like you, which to me is uh, the bottom line, if people like you, they will want potentially offer help. And to me, investors are full of a whole lot more than just money. They are full of a lot of help. And their networks and their offices and the people around them, they can all potentially affect your success if they like you. Any other questions? Any general questions? Anything to do with pitching at all? That's just all I do. Sorry. That's just pitching to investors, pitching to customers. Come on down. What's your name? Yeah, I'm Rob. Hi, Rob. Hi, Lindsay. Oh, okay. She said, he said your name. Oh, I'm like, that was really weird. <laughs> you can read mine. I can read mine, yes. <laughs> All right, so go ahead. So we had, a, we had a question, you know. Thank you. So we thought of uh, maybe piggybacking on another, another brand. So, so okay. our quick one would be a collaborative Snapchat. We're a collaborative Snapchat. Show of hands. How many of you use or know what Snapchat is, please? Big show of hands. So you've lost 10-ish percent of the room. That would probably work around here. What about instantly sandwich videos with friends? Instantly sandwich? Or interesting. Collaborate with video. Yeah. Well, say it to everybody. Instantly. Come to an agreement on what you want to say collaborate. first. Collaborate. <laughs> collaborate with friends videos. Well, now you're. <laughs> now it's collaborate sort your, with your friends. Uh, make videos and collaborate with your friends. Make videos and collaborate with your friends. Okay, does that mean I get to make videos oh, and then I go oh, and put video. another spin on it? Uh, Hello, I'm Nathan. I'm Philip. Hello, Philip. How about social video production in the palm of your hand? Oh, boom! Whoa. Instant social video production in the palm. Of your hand. Instant social video <laughs> production yeah, in the palm works. of your hand. Now we're getting somewhere. See what right. happens when you put two, three. Does anybody down. understand what that is? You know what? Wait, 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 wait. It doesn't matter if they know One what buyer. it is. It matters if they want to know more. If they're curious. Does it generate curiosity? Yes or no? Yes, hands up. You got it. All right. Keep going with it. Thank you. Well done. Well done. So I want to bring up a point, and I was hoping it would come up. If not, I would have finished with it, is that what was just done, what Rob and team, Rob and team did, is very dangerous. The first thing that you say, if you say, we're the Airbnb of chairs. Uh, we are the Yelp for home care. Or... You know what the third one is? Come on. We're the Uber, but for window shades. You know, whatever it is they're equating it to. So uh, Wall Street Journal did an article, I think it was last year, what are the top technical references that entrepreneurs use when they try to tell other people what they do? Uber, Yelp, Airbnb, top three. So if you want to stand out, don't use those in the first sentence, in the first sentence. You can use it later on, those technical references. I actually had somebody years ago say, we're a little bit like uh, LinkedIn and Facebook plus Quora. <laughs> that's, that's like what we do, really? And that was when Quora was like brand new on the ears. We didn't even know oh, Quora, what? what is that? We know what LinkedIn and Facebook is. Now, if you have a journalist say, Something like, on the front cover of the Financial Times, they say, so All Square Golf, which came from this building. The Facebook and LinkedIn for golfers worldwide. I would quote that all day long, because I didn't make it up. The Financial Times put it on their paper, <coughs> their website. So anytime you can get validation like that, go ahead and use the technical references that the journalists use. 
but don't claim them on your own, please. It's a little bit arrogant. And there are much more effective ways of doing it, and then you won't get caught with the other social networking companies doing something comparing themselves to Airbnb, or Uber, or Yelp, or whatever, Snapchat. But you, you test your audience, all about the audience. If you're talking to investors and they all know about Snapchat, and they all use Snapchat, and they have friends that invest in Snapchat, you can use that. But the combination of the things the three of you came up with a few minutes ago, super. Okay? So now you see, not only do you have the tools that I've reminded you about that you didn't have before, such as the similes, analogies, metaphors, and examples, which you all knew about, now you have that value proposition matrix that you can get all your value proposition data into one place so that you can start using it, massaging it, and using it for each audience, depending on who they are. And then you just have to put it together and test it out. And you saw three, four examples of how it worked here today. So now it's a matter of going off and creating your own. So thank you very much, and I'll hand it back to Connie.